Hi everybody, it's summer and I just sent out some emails to a lot of my students, both new students and continuing ones, about new music that they're going to work on while they're away for the summer. The idea being that they could hit the ground running in the fall and show up and have a lot done, not having wasted the summer, but actually having grown in their musicianship. That's what we all want. So this video is about what to do when you have a new piece of music that you are going to work on. So here's a few ideas off the top of my head. One is, um, if possible, get a real score. Don't just work off IMSLP. I like IMSLP. It's amazing. There's incredible stuff there. Uh, I look at it all the time. Uh, it's, there's some really cool um, early versions, early editions, original manuscripts. Just incredible stuff there. Uh, so it's great. But for working especially on standard repertoire where a publisher is currently putting out a version of this piece, uh, spend money and, and buy the book. Unless you don't want there to be any music publishers left because that's actually what's going to happen. If everybody just uses IMSLP, Henley will be gone and um, International will be gone and uh, Durand and everybody else. There just won't be any music publishers. Uh, the reason though is because a, a lot of these really good editions have had some very fine editing and research work go into them. So for example, you can have all this information about, um, you know, in the original manuscript, uh, it says E natural, but then later the composer corrected it subsequently in a student's version and it's this. So you can know all that cool stuff about the supposedly correct version. The other thing is, um, if you work off IMSLP all the time, what you end up with is a huge pile of printouts that get crumbled in your locker or your backpack, and you never develop a decent personal music library. And, and all you have is this messy pile of papers, and that's not really a way to develop as a professional. I mean, if, if you met someone and they said, yeah, I'm a music professional, and, and they showed you their collection of music, and it's this ratty, nasty collection of printouts that are all crumbled up, you, you would wonder if that person really was a professional. So think long term about this whole question of IMSLP. Of course we all look at it when something's out of print. Of course we go there to find it. But I, I do think it's an issue that's going to affect us down the road. Get a real score. Second, especially if you're young, if you're kind of on the early side of learning about music, it's quite possible that you could be assigned a piece by, say, Debussy, and you've never heard anything by Debussy, never played anything by Debussy. You don't know who he is. You say his name wrong, Debussy or Debussy, or, you know, you sound like a total noob. Um, and, and you can sit down and start trying to hammer out the notes and, and just have no clue of where he's coming from. And you'll sound like you have no clue. So you have to listen. Listen to everything. Um, not so much bad recordings and amateur stuff on YouTube, but good professional recordings. Not only of that piece, but by lots of other pieces by the same composer. Other instrumentation, vocal and instrumental music and symphonies and stuff. And by other composers from the same time. And you'll start to get a much broader picture of what this is supposed to sound like. Imagine a Shakespearean actor who kind of doesn't get uh, Elizabeth, Elizabethan England, you know, the accent and the costumes, and they're just trying to say the lines, but they're completely clueless about this larger world of Shakespeare. They're just not going to sound right, and they're not going to know that they don't sound right, which is the pinnacle of cluelessness, okay, when you don't know what you don't know. So develop a lot of context for yourself. Take it upon yourself, because really nobody else is going to do it for you. One time when I was in school, you know, I was in grad school, and I, I had to admit I was a little embarrassed. Of course I know about the Beethoven symphonies. Everyone's always talking about the Beethoven symphonies. But actually I'd never sat down and listened to all the Beethoven symphonies. So I went and got recordings and the scores, and I did one symphony a night for, for nine nights. And uh, I got a real education. After that, I understood stuff about Beethoven I did not know before. But no one was going to do that for me. I had to do it for myself. Okay, so let's say we have a decent score, we've listened to some background, you have a clue 
how to say the name Debussy and you have a clue of what his music sounds like and why he wrote the way he did. So the next thing to do is to map out the piece. Um, what are the sections and what is going on in each section? If I can put it this way, what is the argument? What is the composer trying to prove in the first section? Uh, what are you trying to say? All right, now you go off to this other section. What's, what's that for? What argument are you making? What are you trying to get me to believe by writing this section? And then the next one, and the next one, and so on. Uh, so this is very general. What is the point of each part of the music? And how are you going to play it in order to communicate that point? Uh, oh, there's nothing worse than listening to somebody play, and, and they have no clue why this section is there, and what it's for, and what it's supposed to be proving. They're just hammering away at notes. Uh, that is that is what can make judging piano competitions into a very very long day stuff like that All right, so if you are not already studying Harmony on a serious level. It's time to get serious about that Because this is the language of music. This, this is the mechanics of music. This is how everything is made how everything is understood how we learn it um, so if as a younger person you just kind of did what's, what the notes said and didn't think about it. Th those days should be over. You should know what key you're in and what chord you are on within that key. So for example, in these four measures, I am in A major and I'm on the one chord or the A major chord. Then I'm on the two, six, five chord or the B minor seven chord in first inversion. Now I'm on the dominant chord and now once again, the tonic of A major. You should be able to recite this at any given moment for any piece of music where this kind of language is used. So in other words, from Bach uh, and uh, really up to late Romanticism, you should be able to say, what key am I in and what chord am I on? So it's time to get serious about that stuff. Uh, break the piece into separate tasks because, of course, a piece is not homogenous in its texture. You know, it does stuff with a lot of notes and then stuff with only a few notes and then fast notes and slow notes. So the, the sections are not at all equal as far as the kind of work or the amount of work you might have to do to play that. When I learned all the Chopin ballades, the first thing I did is I went straight for the coda of each ballade because that's, that's where all the blood and guts are. Uh, all the difficult stuff, uh, all the real technical stuff that you have to figure out is, is in those codas. So I just learned those first because I knew when performance time came, I would be glad if the codas were the part I had known the longest. Um, especially with busy 16th note kind of stuff, the task of grouping is crucial. You really cannot play busy flowing 16ths of Bach, Mozart, uh, Mendelssohn, this kind of stuff. Chopin, if you have not done the work of grouping. Um, fingering is useless without grouping. Grouping comes before fingering. If you don't understand grouping, I have videos on that. I invite you to go watch them. Uh, for I spent a lot of my career untangling students who don't understand grouping. Uh, just untangling all the messy, twisted up way that they're trying to get around the piano and showing them from basic principles, how grouping actually works. Uh, once you understand grouping, fingering is fairly obvious and fairly easy. So anyway, check out grouping. I would also recommend that you conduct your piece as though you are a conductor with a baton, you don't have to play the piano, and you can just think about how the music goes and not all the problems of getting around the piano. Playing the piano distracts us, actually, from what's going on musically. And uh, sometimes we're so busy playing all these 88 keys, we're not even thinking about the musical message, the contours, the direction, the ebb and flow of, of the music. And conducting an imaginary performance actually reconnects you with the basic idea of what, why is this piece even good? What do you even want to have happen when you play this piece? So conducting an imaginary pianist is super valuable. All right. Well, you probably have other ideas of what you find useful. You can stick them in a comment 
and start a conversation if you want. All right? So best of luck with your new stuff. And my students, I'll see you in the fall with your new music. Ciao.